Welcome to my Commodore 64 Games Memories. This is where I look at old games and some of the technical details behind them. Let's get into it. Today we have License to Kill, published by Domark in 1989, developed by Anthony West and Christopher West, and the musician was David Whittaker. I'm having a quick look at the tape image here with my tape analysis tool just to see how the auto run is going to work so I can familiarize myself with that first. I also have two G64 disk images. One is licensed to kill and the other one is licensed to kill but one is spelt with, an, with a C and the other one is spelt with an S. I'm wondering what is the difference between these so I'm having a look with my updated C1541 utility and I can see that one is got well it's got one file which is an auto run file I guess but it's the disk is labeled with NTSC or rather the identification it's got NTSC on it. The other disk the one with an S instead of a C licensed to kill with an S there uh, it has a much larger directory as you can see and it's not labeled with NTSC the disk label itself is LTK rather than license to kill as the full title just looking for any documentation about the protection scheme for this disk image I can see here that the protection is meant to have data duplication on track 36 and 41 so the protection is actually not that strong on the disk image. The other side of the disk says that it, it looks like it's empty, so probably only really one-sided disk. There isn't a license with an S there for license to kill, so this is the PAL version. This isn't unexpected because the NTSC version of the disk looks a lot different to the PAL version of the disk. I'm just going to use my updated tool to recover files on the NTSC and on the PAL version of the disk, just to see if there are any interesting files left hidden in the directory there. It doesn't look like there is anything interesting. Those four kilobyte files are maybe a little bit more interesting than the one kilobyte files which are probably really really short. This is the directory block block allocation map. You can see that it has been extensively edited. I don't think there's anything interesting in these files. They're all far too short really. So the protection on the NTSC version or rather the loader may or may not be part of the protection check to be honest uh, it doesn't seem to have any disk block chains in there because this updated utility that I've been working on uh, looks for unallocated disk block chains so I'm, I'm guessing that if the data is on the disk then it's probably encrypted uh, probably exclusive or with a particular value which is going to make it more difficult to follow the disk chains if the track and sector bytes at the start of every block are also XORed or EORed with a value. So the PAL version of the disk uh, has a whole bunch of zero length blocks or files um, they're all empty. We've got the directory block there, plus also this 38 kilobyte data blob. Maybe this is lightly encrypted or exclusive or, or scrambled rather. Uh, maybe the final loader or something loads in this file. Anyway, this is the directory block it hasn't been edited as extensively as the NTSC version of the disk. Let's do a quick check of the NTSC version of the game first. Let's choose NTSC for the emulator and 
run the disk image. Let's also set up the text, uh, the graphics text screen view so that we can see what's loaded at the beginning of memory. I can see a 20.6.2015.2075 try logic version 3.2 message there, which is somewhat interesting. Uh, however, the load seems to have not worked. Hmm, I wonder why that is. Let's just double check that we have a virtual device traps off on the disk and everything else like that. Let's try that again. So yes, try logic version 3.2 message there at the beginning of memory. Well, it's at 800 in hex. It's a sys 2075 try logic. So that's, what's that? That's the expert cartridge, right? So it looks like the entity SC version of the disk is not really working. Okay, that's not an issue. Let's go to the PAL version of the disk. So anyway, the PAL version. I remember getting this game. I think it was on tape, actually. Uh, because it's one of these film movie tie-ins, uh, the game does actually show some, some sequences which bear some resemblance to the film. You know, when I play this game, when I look at this game, I get the distinct feeling that this was a conversion done. Uh, it should, be, should have been relatively quickly, uh, basically with a whole bunch of bolt together libraries, probably as quickly and efficiently as possible. It's not that bad, uh, but perhaps it's not as good as what it could have been if it had more time given to it during its development perhaps. That's, that's the impression that I get when I play this game. I, I felt that when I was playing this game originally way back in the day. So we can see that the data has been basically loaded uh, unencrypted by the looks of it but probably compressed during the load. It's just loading in some data now at the beginning of memory yeah, that's interesting. It seems to have loaded in a chunk and then moved it and then it's loading another chunk now which is the real memory for this particular part of, of memory. So there we go, scanning through memory, doing some decompression pass and then we get this title screen. If we have a look through the text screens just quickly to see what we get. Well, we've got some sprites we can see where all the sprites are. We can see down there we, uh, there's a an animated O, B, N and D for the Bond logo which comes up between levels. Uh, actually, when you die as well, I think it comes up. So we have this music, which kind of bears a resemblance to the to the movie, right? We've got a whole bunch of character sets up right at the end of memory, but I have a feeling those character sets are copied into the bank at 4,000 in hex all the way up to 7FFF. So there's the character set which is currently being used for the title screen. And there we go, the, the level character set got copied in I've paused the game here, but even though the game is paused, the rotor blades on the helicopter still spin around. We can see that it's using a nice double buffered screen, two, two double buffered text screens, basically. Or character screens, rather. Now, these black lines in the score panel, even though it's vertically scrolling, we have another vertical split game. There are a few, actually, on the Commodore 64. Uh, this one, this game was suggested to me in the YouTube comments to have a look up, to have a look at rather, because it's got to get another vertical split screen scroll. Now, because we've got these black lines between the letters and the lives and, and the energy and everything else, we know that to be able to have a static 
score panel with a vertical scroll, we need to counter scroll. In other words, scroll the characters in an opposite way. And we can see that in the graphics map debug view. We can see the score characters bouncing up and down in pixel increments. But on the Commodore 64 screen, of course, as the screen scrolls down, the characters scroll up and the hardware scroll is only eight pixels in range. So that's why the score panel scrolls up and then jumps back down, scrolls up and jumps down because it is scrolling the score panel graphics in opposition to the direction of the scrolling screen in hardware. And if you want to avoid scrolling too much data, if we have a look at the, uh, the, the graphics character set debug view, you can see that the numbers and the characters there and the graphical effect for the energy bars, they're being scrolled up uh, into the character next to it. So the characters are above and below each other. So each line in the score panel is actually two characters, one on top of each other, so they're 16 pixels high, but they're constantly being scrolled up, again in opposition to the screen scroll. So that's how the vertical, vertical split uh, score panel and screen scroll works. And uh, the game, now if you have a look, there's a little vertical white line between the game area and the score panel, but it's not wide enough to obscure full sprite. So actually the game is pretty clever in that it doesn't move or tend to move sprites over that split between the score panel and the game display. So I'm just having a little look here at the hello file and we can see that it's loaded this chunk of memory into, or a chunk of file data into memory here. And I don't think it's really containing anything that interesting. I just thought it might have been part of the protection check, but it's not. Okay, moving on. Now, if we have a look at the title screen, uh, graphics, text screens, we can see that there's a little sprite which goes over the, the middle, which is meant to be the, like the gun sight or something like that, right, from James Bond films. And it is showing uh, the black text in front of the sprite. So the sprite is behind the text here. You can see that it's highlighting the by Quixel, for example. There we go. It, it basically, the, the white sprite shows the black characters that are in front of the sprite. The sprite is behind the black characters. The title screen has that other double buffered screen, but it's not really double buffered. It's you just using one bank. It's just got that blank title screen there. It's probably decompressed it somewhere, and then it's superimposing the text on top of the other bank as well, just to get that rendered. So I'm just putting a breakpoint here for most of the lower part of memory because I want to see, aha, uh -huh. there you go. See, it's loaded the first chunk of memory and then it's running this code. And what this code does is that it looks like it's doing, huh, well, okay. So there's this code in, in what's default screen memory after it's loaded a low chunk of memory and it looks like this code is, let's have a little look. Oh, let's get rid of that, we don't need that. Right, uh, so it does a, does a JSR to F00 and then it sets up a few registers and then JSRs to F480, mm -hmm. okay. Ah, okay, so this is loading from the low low memory that was just loaded and then it looks like yeah we can see here look it's mm -hmm, okay so it's loading from the low chunk of memory that was loaded pre just now and then it's storing it into dc00 dd00 uh, c00 so it's moving it up into high ram but it's also moving it up into high ram underneath the VIC chip, the SID chip, the IO, etc. Oh, and the color RAM as well. I think I saw D800 there as well, which is color RAM. 
So it's moving this low chunk of memory up into high memory underneath all of the I.O. and everything. So it's, it's populating the RAM there. And then it loads uh, a whole bunch of data. Oh, and there we go. It's, it's loading from 200 and storing it into D800. Mm, okay, this, ah, this looks like trilogic uh, state restoration and decompression. So this is the expert cartridge again. You'll notice that look, there's a SIS2075, Trilogic version 3.2 in the low memory there. Let's get back to that point again, but stop it just before it's going to do the, the decompression. So here we go. So we'll stop it before it gets into the Trilogic stuff. So there we go. It's loaded a whole bunch of data and it's loading another chunk of data. If we have a look at the memory view, we can see that quite plainly. Let's, a number of times I make that mistake, type, doing a, a typo for that command, which isn't abbreviated in this version of Vice, old version of Vice, bundled with ICU debugger. Ah, there we go. Okay, so we're back here again. Right, so uh, let's let that routine do its memory move, but then we'll put a breakpoint here, so hopefully it, it will return. I mean, I think it did do an RTS, right? It doesn't put anything on the stack or anything, so okay. <laughs> okay, when the disassembly has a whole bunch of knobs, it scrolls. There we go. Okay, so it's doing a CLI and an RTS. That CLI is going to get tricky because uh, it will allow the interrupts to start running again quite annoying okay I mean it's stopping the interrupts it's sw switching out the IO spaces and everything else and it's enabling the RAM underneath them and then it's doing a copy and then it clears the interrupt disable flag which enables the interrupts so anyway we're setting up these registers look probably low and high and then going to 480 and it's storing X and Y in 5BE and 5BF there so it's stashing it a little bit but then it's calling this, and it's FFBA, FFBD, FFD5. This is a load. These kernel memory addresses are very obviously uh, set LFS, set NAM, and probably load, right? I don't think I need to load the kernel labels to understand what that's doing. It's loading the next file. That's set NAM, right, if I remember correctly and it is setting up the name. The length is in the accumulator, I think, and then the low and high address is, uh, well, the, the, the address is, there we go, it's 5C8, and we can see that it's loading the LO file. <laughs> okay, so it's loading that chunk of data. After it's loaded the chunk of data, it, it does an RTS and it does a jump. It sets up a VIC register, D011, which is what, multicolor character mode or something? Something like that. Is it? I forget. I, I don't think it's important. But anyway, 81B is, oh look. Well, we have a whole bunch of compressed data. Mm, we have a 38911, and then we have a whole bunch of repeating bytes, probably indicating an RLE. Uh, blank part of memory maybe we'll see what that is in a bit we've got what looks like a machine code monitor there uh, searching for loading g space 4800 that's a go 4800 that's probably going to be a decompressed screen of the current monitor view that was used during the development of this Hmm. Anyway, I think that that 38911 is the same as the number of free bytes uh, that we see in the basic startup message. So I have a feeling that uh, Trilogic version 3.2, so the expert cartridge, right, uh, was used to take a snapshot of the game just after it was loaded and started from a monitor, perhaps, machine code monitor. Um, and then the snapshotted version of the game was then just stuffed onto a disc or stuffed onto a tape and then distributed.
bingo, as long as it works, you know that it works. So you don't need anything else complicated for the loader. You just load the data, right? It is a bit weird that if it's using if it's using the the trilogic, you know, the freeze and unfreeze functionality, then it's a bit weird that it's putting data into the RAM underneath the I/O, because usually the unfreeze stuff would from from trilogic the unfreeze stuff would just copy over all of the the RAM state anyway. And, and the I.O. state is actually doing a restore with the I.O. state as well. So I don't know why it's doing that. Very strange. But okay, whatever. So this jump to 81B is going to be... Oh, it is. It's that 2075, right? Sys2075. So yeah, this is just, just... This is a bit puzzling. I don't know why it would have done that. But okay. So I'm just adding some notes there about things that I can observe in this, what looks like compressed data. It would be nice if the machine code monitor was in memory, but I doubt whether it is. We'll see. Uh, one of these other games, right? Uh, they had partial, uh, partial uh, parallel port, user port. Uh, uh, there was a user port loader stub sitting there right and it was partially i was able to get it to partially run but the full loader for the user port data transfer wasn't actually there anyway so zero page looks like it's not really initialized with the the end of memory or anything now the, the trilogic stuff i don't think assumes uh, I think it bakes in the end address for the compressed memory actually in the in its output. It doesn't assume what it gets from the kernel load at all, uh, which is great. Uh, it's better that the zero page assumptions are not made. To be honest, it makes the decompression more robust. So anyway, let's see if we can trace through this trilogic uh, decompression. To do this, I need to stop just before it does its jump. Wow, look, it copies all of its data way down to the beginning of zero page there and then it jumps into it. That's good, isn't it? So I'm just setting a ranged breakpoint now and remembering that I need to uh, use the full command there. So let's do a step. So this is some code here at 480 uh, which was doing some restoration of, of color RAM and stuff like that. Some extra code here, which just 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 does some memory shuffling and stuff. You can see here it's doing a load from two hundred and stuffing it into D eight zero zero, and it's it's decom decompressing the low and high four bit values, the nibbles from one byte, because the color RAM is only four bits in size, up at D80, D800, and to DBFF. It's also restoring into D00, DD, DC00, and D400, which is the VIC, CIA1 and 2, and also the, the SID. So there's that jump to uh, 0003 right at the end of this routine. So it, because the data is compressed, it's able to store all of this extra color RAM and everything at the end uh, of the, the compressed data. So before it does a full extraction, I guess, it does the IO and all of the color RAM and the VIC and everything else restoration first, but then everything has to be put on pause. And you can see actually it's set up the stack pointer as well. <laughs> the stack is not set up to use the full stack. Of course, it's set up to use whatever the stack was at the point where it was frozen, I guess. Anyway, it's doing a whole bunch of data move there. And then it does a, a, a load X TXS, and then it does a jump 409B at the end there. So if we do an X to, we'll, we'll put a range breakpoint as well, just to make sure that we don't escape too early from this decompression. 
that JSR to 80 uh, looks like it's doing a okay looks like it's reading the byte from the compressed from the compressed data stream okay uh, anyway so this last jump here to 409b probably jumps into the restored code now if you have a look at the text screen look it's decompressed the text screen there in the top right hand corner shows uh, ready sys dollar zero and then it's going into the monitor it's doing a load g searching for g loading and then g four eight zero zero so that's what the monitor said so yeah the monitor screen is there but i don't think because the, it looks like the game start address is at four eight zero zero right but we're not jumping into 4800 we're jumping back into 409b so i guess the cartridge freeze button was pressed at some point during the game startup so i guess the game was doing a whole bunch of memory viewing memory shuffling and stuff like that so anyway with all of that memory shuffling going on the, the game probably had a very short pause time period window if you like for where the freeze button could be approximately safely pressed I'm guessing if anyone knows what well that monitor is probably the expert cartridge monitor right but if anyone knows for sure then please do put in the comments below let me know but I'm pretty sure that that's just the machine code monitor from the expert cartridge so here we are uh, there's a load oh look it's restoring the last bit of um, zero page lower zero page registers real zero page registers and then it's mm, clearing the memory with dollar two zero, which is thirty two in decimal, and then it's jumping back to one e three, which is at the end of the stack. Oh uh, look, and it's doing a store dex da 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 da. So it's clearing, clearing that last part of memory of itself, and then doing an RTI. The RTI is going to be pulling values from wherever it is on the stack, right? This uh, TriLogic freeze state restoration code, which I think we're having a look at here, was really quite an involved piece of code. Uh, it seems to be able to scan and spot parts of memory which are unused or contain repeated bytes and then stuff it and then put, put that or use that memory which should be cleared to consistent values. Uh, it seems to put its game... Uh, restoration code or game state computer state restoration code in those spare parts of memory and then clear itself afterwards which is quite clever so uh one thing or one takeaway from that is is that if you wanted to be a game and to avoid having a frozen version of your game being released by the hacker cartridge was to make your game memory all you use all of the commodore 64's memory store every store data into all of the Commodore 64's memory and don't have a whole bunch of clear memory which can be repurposed for different usage yeah, I guess so anyway this RTI then goes back into this code hmm isn't that weird it's doing a NOP ISP it looks like huh it looks like the state restoration goes and jumps back into bad code eventually it gets into this JSR which is from an RTS there that you can see in the instruction history look it's lucky I think it's lucky that the restoration code goes back into the game code I wonder what unintended or unintentional bugs that introduces in the game because yes this this trilogic state restoration has been running those dodgy opcodes all this time well there we go it's amazing that the game still works lucky very lucky so there is a whole bunch of code there at 4800 which is where the monitor says that the game code should start at but it never actually runs it it's probably already just run it but the freeze was the freeze happened obviously after that <laughs> i expect whoever was putting together this frozen version uh, went into the monitor, typed in G4800, press return, and then almost immediately pressed the freeze button. <laughs> I expect that's the way it worked. Uh, so we can double check here when we do a disassembly through the memory that that the code there does do some initialization, but it doesn't look like it's 
full initialization of, of the machine state. So anyway, it does go back into this game. Eventually, just lucky, I guess. So moving on, let's have a look at the tape version. And the tape version does this auto run loader. We can see here that we've got a wild save copyright Interceptor Micros 1987, written by Andrew Chalice, January 1987. Hello, hacker. I hope you have fun with this loader. So we have the usual kind of wild save hacker hello message. Uh, this tape version doesn't have any loading screen. It uh, doesn't have any music or anything like that. It is a backward load, which we've seen is the usual kind of thing that we normally see with the wild save. We can see the message for hackers from Andrew Chalice. A little bit easier here, but yeah, loading backwards through memory. Let's put a ranged breakpoint in here as well. We know that the loader code is sitting down at the beginning of zero page. So we'll just let this, this run now. We'll see where we get to. Don't forget, this is the tape version. So the loader is actually quite a lot slower, but I'm warping ahead at nearly 12 times the speed here. So here we go, backwards loading, la 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 la. Oh look, it's, it's the same frozen code. Okay, so maybe the programmer was using the um, expert cartridge machine code monitor here, I guess it was, and, and then produced a frozen version of the game and then gave that one out to be mastered into the tape and the disk version. It's a possibility. Um, or the person doing the tape and disk mastering did the freeze themselves. I wonder which one it is. If the person doing the freeze or the original programmer wants to let me know in the comments section below, then please do. Um, let me know. But I'm, I'm leaning towards it being the master process of creating this game uh, to, to actually do the, well, maybe, we'll see. Yeah, just please do let me know in the comments section below if you know. So this looks like uh, it's doing the same RTI. Now, because it's doing the RTI, but this is the tape version, there is an interrupt running, not like the disk version where I think um, uh, the the interrupt timing was different, right? Uh, this this is doing the, and the, there we go, it's doing a no op ISB, LDA, BMI. So it's running this weird, code again, this no op with an absolute address in the index with X is <laughs> a really funny no op variant. It's a valid instruction, but it's extremely unusual. And ISB is, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a standard instruction. Let's put it like that. It doesn't look like it's due to being a bank of ROM or CPU issue or RAM issue. Cause if I change the bank, it doesn't change the code that's being run. So, yeah, the tape and disk version seem to use the same lucky, don't know how it quite works, try logic compressed, frozen version. Okay, fine. So let's go into C64 debug GUI just to double check a few bits and pieces with the graphics layout. We can see on the title screen if we go into the Vic debug view. There we go. Uh, we can see where the sprites are active. So we can see that there's a sprite as we thought for the, for the circle moving across the screen, revealing the black text in front of the, the, the sprite circle there. There we go, definitely a sprite. It's actually got a little sprite which trails along behind it, look, which kind of like fades out to black from white. Well, you can see that there is a bit of multiplexing going on here. And we can see the counter rotating score. And there we go. The animated bond letters were actually expanded horizontal and vertical high resolution sprites by the looks of it. Again, not really a surprise. Uh, I'm trying to find the menu option to enable the joystick in port one. This game is unusual. It uses the joystick port one rather than joystick port two. Uh, there we go. That's fine. Right. 
So as I move the targeting crosshair up for the raster position, if I move it up and down the screen a bit more, we can see where the, the, the multiplexing for the sprites goes in. We can see that the rotor blades for the helicopter, if I can stop down long enough, we can see that the rotor blades for the helicopter are using uh, an expanded high resolution sprite. The shadow for the helicopter is using a vertically expanded sprite. That's the explosion. That's not going to help, is it? Let's go back and actually run it again. There we go. Bing. Right. Yeah, so the, there we go. Somewhere along here, there we go. We, we've got the code coming along to multiplex the sprites for this great big helicopter. So the helicopter itself uses one, two, three, four sprites. One of them horizontally and vertically expanded, the, the other one for the shadow vertically expanded. And then we've got two sprites bolted on top of each other for the main body of the helicopter. And it's quite a lot of sprites, isn't it, for a, for a player character. Interestingly, if you notice, the bullets are not sprites. The bullets are actually updated characters in the character set. So the bullets don't show red boxes around them, right? There's a bullet there in the middle of the road underneath the helicopter. There's no red box around there. So this game is interesting that it uses uh, dynamically updated characters for its bullets, at least in this part of the level anyway. You can see that the bullets there from whatever they are, the houses or whatever, um, are scrolling with the background. So I like that. I like that it's using dynamically updated characters for the bullets. We can see up at the top and bottom of the screen there that for whatever reason there are some there are some parked sprites. See, there's some sprites which haven't been initialized. And again, we can see those parked sprites on, on the title screen as well. Quite unusual. I guess the the sprite position is just set, but the, the enable register is always set to be FF or something like that, rather than setting the enable register for only the visible sprites that you want to see on the screen. I like this little uh, animating transition for the bond message that comes up. It's a nice little touch, but it uses an awful lot of sprite frames, which could have been better spent on the game. But okay, never mind. Again, look at the, the graphics there for the for the bullet trails. You can see them quite clearly over the road. The thing is, is that they're very small, like what two pixels big. It's very difficult to see them, even though they're black bullets. Uh, they're very difficult to see against the background. They could have done with being bigger. Uh, and made to flash, but if they were made to flash, then that would have been a lot more difficult, and probably they'd have to have used sprites. So aside from updating the, the graphics of the, for the helicopter, there doesn't seem to be a whole bunch of extra multiplexing going on, really, to be honest. Maybe there is, but just in this part of the game here, it's not really stressing the number of sprites that are the needed by the Commodore 64. Anyway, I can't really think of anything else to dive into, technically speaking, for this game. Uh, the vertical screen scroll was kind of interesting and the different versions of the tape and the disc versions. And this interesting multiplexing aspect for the, for the main sprite for the game. So if you like these kind of technical deep dive videos, then please do consider liking or subscribing to this channel. And if you like, if you want to, then please do add a comment in the comment section below. It's always nice to hear from people and also suggest other games that you would like to see on and to see how their technical aspects work. So take care, have a great day wherever you are.